if you are a macOS developer and you've updated to Xcode 13 and created a new project, you may have noticed that there's this new um, method in the application delegate, application supports secure restorable state, which by default returns yes. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, describe the vulnerability that necessitated this change and show how this could be applied for three different types of attacks. I'm Thijs Alkmaarde. I'm a security researcher at CompuTest. CompuTest is a security testing company in the Netherlands. We provide security services like pen testing, incident response, um, code auditing, stuff like that. But I'm, together with my colleague Dan Kuiper, part of the research department, which means that we don't work for customers, but instead we well, can basically research anything that we think is important. So we try to look for stuff to, um, that has a lot of users or where impact can be large, just with, to make the world a little bit safer. Uh, other work you may have seen from us is our zero-click RCE in Zoom at Pwn to Own last year. And we won Pwn to Own Miami this year with five different vulnerabilities in ICS systems. There's write-ups of these uh, on our website if you want to know more about these. But today I'm going to be talking about macOS security, which has been a bit of a specialty for me. I've been doing a lot of work with macOS over the years. Um, it's a system I really know the best. Uh, all of these were just incidents, but macOS is really where yeah, I'm passionate for. Uh, this talk will consist of three parts. Uh, first of all, I'll talk a, talk a little bit about the macOS security model, because many people don't really understand how the security model works. Uh, many people still have incorrect assumptions about uh, how the security works on macOS. And then I'll describe the vulnerability that I found, a process injection vulnerability. And then in the third part, I'll demonstrate how this vulnerability could be applied for escaping the sandbox, privilege escalation, and bypassing SIP. So, first of all, the macOS security model. So, th to describe the security model, I'll first describe the unix um, security model that used to be used by macOS as well. Um, and the basic idea behind this security model is that users are security boundaries, but processes are not. So if you look at the um, permissions for files, and that is determined by the owner and the group. And there's these nine different bits that determine whether the owner or uh, group or everybody is allowed to read, write, or execute that file. Also, if you want to attach a debugger to another process, then in general, those need to be running as the same user. There's one exception. There's the root user who always has access to all files, can attach to any process, and therefore, they can basically access all of the data on the system by just, uh, yeah, whether in memory or on disk, they can always get access to it. Now, this used to be the same security model as macOS has, but this has, this has changed. So, in 2015, with the release of El Capitan, Apple introduced system integrity protection. And this is a screenshot from the uh, WWDC talk where they introduced this. And the basic idea behind system integrity protection was, at the time, there were two things. Um, there was to make a security boundary between any process running as root and the kernel. And secondly, to protect the operating system from being modified by even by the root user. So this feature is also known as rootless sometimes internally. Uh, many people thought that that would mean that Apple would take the root user away from, from normal users, like on iOS where you have no root user. But this is really not what's meant by that name. Um, the idea behind it is that root is less powerful, so that's why it's rootless. But of course, there do need to be processes that can modify the system because you need to be able to install updates. So for that, what they use are entitlements, which are basically metadata that is included when generating a code signature for an application. So to do dangerous operations like loading a kernel extension, modifying the system files, or debugging a system process, 
you no longer need to be a specific user, but instead the system will check if the process trying to do that has a certain entitlement. Now this is, um, SIP has over the years been extended by Apple with more and more restrictions. For example, debugging any application is now also forbidden by SIP, unless the application specifically allows that. And there's this feature called data vaults. I have an example of that here. So Apple considers your email database, but also your iChat history or your Safari browsing history. Uh, that's very sensitive. So Apple doesn't want any process to be able to read that. So what this is placed into what's known as a data vault. And as you can see, you cannot just list the contents of that directory, but even if you use sudo, you cannot list the contents of that directory. So the only processes that are allowed to access that directory need to have, uh, are those that have a special entitlement. So your mail client, of course, needs to be able to access that directory. So it has this entitlement, com.apple.rootless.storage.mail, and that gives it access to the mail data vault, um, which is that location that I showed before. So mail can access the files in there, but any other process cannot. Of course, this new security model also introduces, introduces new types of vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities become suddenly more important. And one of those is what's known as process injection. And that's basically the ability for one process to execute code or to add code that the system thinks is another process. So the system thinks it's process B with the entitlement of process B, but actually process A specified the code that's being run. And when Apple introduced SIP, uh, on the right there's this one slide of the presentation, they already disabled a lot of things that could be used for that, like task for PIT or uh, DTrace, dynamic library environment variables, stuff like that. And also they added the hardened runtime to make this uh, also possible for third party applications. If they opt into that hardened runtime, um, then it's not now also harder to inject into that process. But macOS is old, it's large, it's established. So there's a lot of code that was written before this change in the security model. And it's really hard to really re-evaluate the entire system when you make a change like this. Now process injection is a vulnerability type that's found often in an incidental way. So you find a third party application that has uh, it's missing the hardened runtime or something like that, or it has an exception. And that can have impacts, like you could, for example, if an application has access to your webcam and you are malware installed on that machine, then in you, if you can inject into that other application, you can use that application's permission to access the webcam without the user uh, being asked to give permission for that. And these attacks also often work by downgrading an application to an older version that did not have the hardened runtime. But of course, that's incidental process injection vulnerabilities. What's way more fun, of course, is if you have a process injection vulnerability that applies everywhere. So we get to this vulnerability CVE-2021-3873 which was a process injection vulnerability in AppKit, which therefore affected all of the applications that are developed using AppKit, which is basically the framework that you use for creating desktop applications on macOS. And what this, uh, this vulnerability was in a feature that's called saved state, or also persistent UI internally. And what this feature is used for is, uh, for example, if you shut down your computer, it asks if you want to restore uh, your open windows the next time you log in. Um, and when it restores those windows, they will have the same locations. And if, if you have an unsafe document and you shut down and then uh, the windows are recovered, then that document should still be there if they correctly implement this. Now, most of this works out of the box. Uh, there's nothing the application needs to do to opt in to this. Uh, but for document-based applications, it can be necessary that it stores some extra data about the document into that saved state. So it can be extended, but by default, it already affects or works in all applications. 
Now, the way this works um, is that it stores a couple of files into a directory, I um, mean, your library saved application state directory. And there's two files important here for this uh, vulnerability. There's the windows.plist file. And uh, this is basically a list of all of the windows that the application has open with an encryption key um, for each window. And there's the data.data file, which is a custom format. As far as I know, it's not used anywhere else on macOS. But it's also a list of records. And each entry in that list is, uh, corresponds to a entry from the Windows uh, file, um, which contains an encrypted serialized object. Now, the encryption here, it's ASCBC. Um, I have no idea why it's encrypted. Uh, because it's, uh, the key and the file are right next to each other. There's no different permissions for the files. So anything that can uh, read that key can also read the file. So I don't understand why it's encrypted. There's also no integrity check on it at all. And the vulnerability here is that it was a serialized object using an insecure serializer, which means that it was possible to exploit it. Now, serialization vulnerabilities are very well known for languages like C-sharp or Java. They also affect Python and Ruby and a lot of other languages. But there hasn't been much published about it for macOS. Now, Apple has a serialization format called NS Coding. And they also realized that these same serialization type vulnerabilities could affect it. So they introduced NS Secure Coding way back in 2012. So, um, quite a long time ago already. And many uses of NS coding where security is important now use that NS secure coding for variant. So it's often used for communication between processes. Um, and there, it's exclusively the secure coding. And it's even apparently used within iMessage. If you send a message to another user, then that message is a serialized object. So you can see that the security of the secure version is very important. And to demonstrate the difference between the insecure and the secure version, in the insecure version, you first create the object, and then you can check, is this the correct type of what I expect? Uh, but for the secure version, you decode the object only if it is of a specific class. So the reason why this first version is insecure is that by the time you create it, um, it already exists. It, the, the constructor or something like that may have been called, or, or the destructor might have been doing something. Uh, so by, yeah, that could lead to a vulnerability if those objects do stuff just by existing. So how would an attack like that work? So you could create a new saved state, write it to that directory with a new encryption key or something like that, um, and then ask the system to open the application. Um, then the application will automatically deserialize that object because it sees there's a saved state that uh, it should be restoring. And then at that point, you are now deserializing that object in another application, which could mean code execution in another application. But of course, now is the challenge. What malicious object can we write there? So I spent some time looking at prior work for this. Uh, one of the famous projects for generating serialized objects for Java is y serial And as for C-sharp, there's y serialnet But y serial Objective-C does not exist. I also spent some time digging through some Google Project Zero write-ups about serialization vulnerabilities. But those were targeting the secure version using specific vulnerabilities that have long since been fixed. So they were also not very useful for what I was trying to do. So I had to really come up with, a, with my own chain of objects to get that code execution. So how did I look for that? So I disassembled a lot of the objects that I could use. Um, I loaded AppKit into a decompiler and looked through all of the de init with coder functions, which are the methods that are being called when a object is deserialized. And I noticed that many of those classes do not um, support secure coding. And also, often those classes are not really intended to be sent to another process. And they were also not very interesting from 
an attacking point of view because they were not doing very much. They were just re recursively decoding some instance variables, um, but that didn't really help me. Uh, I wanted to do more than just decoding an object. But eventually I found a couple of objects that I could use. First of all, there's the NS rule editor. Uh, this is basically the widget that you have in, in mail if you create a mail rule to configure that. Um, when this object is deserialized, it takes two objects from the archive, uh, an owner and a key path, and then it creates a binding using that key path to the owner. Now, bindings are a sort of reactive programming technique in macOS, which means that you can directly connect a model uh, to a view without having to create a controller to uh, yeah, do all of the boilerplate work of updating the view or updating the model. And one interesting thing about creating a binding is that you can sort of uh, specify a key path. So that can be if, you, if your model is a person, then you can bind to the person's name or the person's uh, child's name, uh, something like that. You can sort of go through nested properties with a key path. And, one, and those are intended to be used for properties. But there's basically no check that you're trying to actually bind to a property. You can also specify a method with no arguments, and that will also be possible to bind to. And at the moment that you create that binding, it will invoke that method. So it will call that method to, to get an initial value for the binding. So by just deserializing this object, at this point I could call new methods, but only if they had no arguments. But it's a good first step. Then it's the second step. There's the NS custom image wrap. Uh, this takes two objects from the archive, a op draw object and a uh, draw method. And this is basically a selector. Uh, a selector is something like a function pointer, but for Objective-C method. So it's, it's the name of a method. And then in the draw function of this class, it would call that method on the object that it deserialized. Um, with one argument, namely the image wrap itself. So by combining this with the previous step, where we could call a method with no arguments, we can call the draw method on this object. And at this point, we can now call methods um, even if they have arguments, but we no, don't have any control yet over those arguments. Now, for the sake of time, I have to skip a couple of steps here. Also, for disclosure reasons, there's still some unfixed stuff in here. Um, but I have two steps here now. I can call zero argument methods. I could extend that to call arbitrary methods. Uh, but these are still only on objects that I can deserialize. Um, and then I use the trick to also create objects that are not deserializable. Um, objects that not, do not implement that, that uh, protocol. And then I use a similar trick with a binding to call zero argument methods on those objects. Um, another trick to uh, call arbitrary methods on those objects. And at this point, this point I, can, uh, I also have control of the arguments here. So at this point, I can basically call any Objective-C method that I want with arguments that I specify. So one thing I could do here is just evaluate Apple Script within the process. So this is already very powerful. So for example, if I was attacking mail, then I could co use some Apple Script to copy some files from the data vault to a location where any process can read it or, or just read the contents and send it off to somewhere else. I can also co execute a shell script or something like that um, from Apple Script. So, at this point, I was now executing code within another process, um, but it was limited to Apple Script. And for the attacks that I wanted to do later on, um, for, from, for two of them, this was enough, but for one of them, I really needed something that was equivalent to executing native code. So this Apple Script, it, it's very limited. There's no, uh, yeah, there's restriction on what you can do. So I had to go one step further. <coughs> 
But um, as I mentioned, there's this hardened runtime that is meant to make attacks like this harder. So I could not create any memory pages that were uh, JIT mapped, so not uh, any executable and writable pages. I could not create unsigned memory. I could not load any libraries that were not si signed by either Apple or the same developer. This is library validation. Uh, I could not use uh, dynamic linker environment variables, which is uh, not relevant here. So it was really tricky to figure out how can I execute something that's equivalent to native code within all of these restrictions. Um, and then I noticed that I could load Python framework. So Python was included in macOS at that, at that time, um, and it was signed by Apple, so I can just load it into any process. And if you import the C types module, then you can evaluate basically something that's equivalent to native code. You can call C functions, you can um, create structures, stuff like that. And also C types does not uh, conflict with any of the restrictions of the hardened runtime. So many la programming languages, you can create bindings, but they often need to be compiled, and it doesn't work uh, due to the hardened runtime. But now I had this challenge. I could call Objective-C methods, but I wanted to evaluate Python. And Python doesn't have an Objective-C API that I could call into. So I needed some intermediate step to bridge these two together. So I found another framework I could use. And this is the AppleScript Objective-C bridge. Now this is basically AppleScript combined with access to the Objective-C runtime. So AppleScript that can basically call Objective-C methods, create uh, Objective-C objects. And one interesting thing about this is that you can load new scripts into a process, but even when you have that hardened runtime and library validation, the scripts can be loaded from a bundle that is not signed. So I could put some new scripts into a new bundle, load only the scripts from that bundle, and they would be added to the uh, Objective-C runtime. Now, with this, I could create Objective-C objects, uh, call methods, all of this I could already do before. But what is new here is that I could call C functions from Objective-C or, or the AppleScript Objective-C bridge. But one annoying restriction of this bridge is that I could not create non-object pointers, so pointers to anything else than an Objective-C object. I could not create structs, and I could not work with any C strings that's just not supported by that language. And Python, in order to basically call anything, you need to pass it either a file path or the Python code that you want to evaluate. So you really need a character pointer to yeah, include either the path or uh, some string that you want to evaluate. But then, finally, I had this breakthrough of something that worked. I could call pi main uh, with zero and nil, and that's a valid, valid object in the AppleScript of f c And when you do this, it basically works as if you start a Python REPL. So, um, it reads a script from standard input and then um, acts basically just like Python would if you launch it on the command line. So with this, I could uh, then import C types and evaluate code that's equivalent to native code. Now, if you think that AppleScript or Objective-C, uh, many people say it's for boost, but if you don't think it's for boost enough, then you really should work with that AppleScript Objective-C bridge. I have an example here. So this is how you would uh, call a method in the uh, AppleScript Objective-C bridge. So you really, you need to use that apostrophe to call uh, new methods, and you get these really weird sentences that sort of look like they're supposed to be uh, readable English, but uh, it's really incomprehensible as a language. So to summarize the, the steps uh, needed to get that code execution, we can evaluate AppleScript with the AppleScript Objective-C bridge. Then we can evaluate Python. We can import the C-types module. And at this point, you can just evaluate code that's just equivalent to native code, despite all of the restrictions of the hardened runtime and stuff like that. Now, 
how could we exploit this? I wanted to really make sure that I had all of the impact that this could have um, yeah, described in our report to Apple. So I tried to look for all of the different ways that this vulnerability could be applied. So first of all, to escape the Mac application sandbox. Now what you see here is an open panel. Um, and this may look like a very boring window uh, that you see uh, 100 times a day if you use macOS. But technically, it's actually quite complicated. Because if you are in a sandbox application, then that application doesn't know about all of your files. It cannot list all the files that you have because it's sandboxed. But if the user wants to open a file, then it would be really annoying if they cannot see their files in the application they are using. So Apple created this technology uh, for that. Um, what you, while the window is itself is part of the application, the actual contents of the window are being drawn by a different process. It basically works like an iframe on a website. So it's, it's a different process uh, drawing those contents. And that's the open and safe panel service. So this service does have access to your files. It's not sandboxed. And when you select a file in this panel uh, and click OK, uh, then the application will get temporary access to that file that it can then use to read or write that file. And one thing I noticed about this open panel, if, if it was being opened, is that this open and panel sa service was loading its saved state from the same directory as the application itself. So by creating a new malicious serialized object into that saved state, then triggering the opening of such a panel, it was possible to execute code within that open and safe panel service. And that service was not sandboxed, so at that point I have escaped the sandbox. I'm not completely sure why it was uh, sharing that saved state, but it might have something to do with if the user uh, resizes that window and then they uh, shut down their Mac then it might need to restore, restore the state of that window complete with the state of the, the panel and that might need to be separated by application. Something like that, I'm not entirely sure. And this was fixed earlier than the rest by Apple. This was fixed in 11.3 uh, uh, by no longer sharing that same state, saved state directory. Uh, the next step was to elevate privileges to root. And for this, I basically used the same technique already found by uh, Elias Morat, written in the UNAUTH D logic books for the Win Writer. I looked for an application with the entitlement uh, com.apple.private.authorization services uh, with a value uh, for system install Apple software. And what this entitlement means is that this application is allowed to install packages that are signed by Apple without any authorization by the user user doesn't even see that something is happening. So this is used, for example, by the install command line developer tools application, so, uh, which can uh, update certain parts of the system. And then this can be combined with this specific package, the macOS public beta access utility package. Um, this package, when it's installed to a disk, it will run a post-install script, so after the installation is finished, it will run a script as root from the disk that you installed it to. But there's no check that you actually install it to a macOS uh, disk. You can just install it to any disk, uh, disk image, RAM disk, something like that, and it will still run that same path, that same command uh, on that disk. So because mounting a disk does not require any root privileges, you can mount a disk, put the, a file on the same path, perform the installation of this package, and then in the post-install script, it will invoke that script as root and therefore elevate privileges to root. And then finally, to bypass SIP, or the SIP file system restrictions part, because I wanted to make sure that we had all of the possible attack servers uh, mapped out, I looked at all of the applications I could find with uh, what kind of entitlements they might have. So not just everything included in macOS, but I also looked at the beta installation disk image. And there I found this very interesting application, the macOS update assistance application. 
And it turns out this has an entitlement com.apple.rootless that install that heritable. And what this means is that it basically allowed to write to any SIP protected location or read from any SIP protected location uh, on disk. And as a bonus, it's also heritable. So any sub processes that start will also have the same permission, which is very easy because then you can just uh, spawn the reverse shell instead of having to work in process. And what can we do with a SIP bypass like this? So as mentioned earlier, you can read the uh, mail database of a user. You can read the messages database of Safari history, stuff like that. We can also grant our own application permission to use the webcam. So we can just add ourselves to the database and then we can uh, use the webcam without any permission by the user. We can also persist very well into the system because we could write ourselves to a location that is SIP protected. So for example, we could also remove the malware removal tool Apple uses to delete malware. Uh, maybe even replace it with our own malware. Um, and at that point, Apple could still delete this from the system, but any other AV vendor would not be able to delete it because it was SIP protected. And then finally, we can also load a kernel extension without user approval. So normally loading a kernel extension creates a prompt like that, and then the user still needs to click a couple of times in the security preferences to really make sure that they want to load that kernel extension. But we can just pre-approve any kernel extension to be loaded. Now, that doesn't directly give kernel code execution because you still need a validly signed kernel extension. And because Apple is deprecating kernel extensions, getting such a certificate is uh, pretty much impossible right now. But because you can approve just any kernel extension, we could look at all of them, try to find one with the vulnerability we could abuse, and then we could also get kernel code execution if we wanted to. But with the SIP file system bypass, we already have a lot of access to all of the files on the system. So we have already compromised a lot of the data there and kernel co code execution. It would be a nice bonus, but uh, would not get, give that much extra access to the system. Now here's a video to demonstrate this attack. Uh, this is on macOS 11.2.3, I think. Uh, first of all, it demonstrates that the sandbox application is actually sandboxed. And then it will uh, do the three steps in order here. Uh, the privilege escalation step is a little bit slower because it needs to create that RAM disk, uh, do the installation to that. It's also not trying to be subtle. You can see the disk image appear on the desktop there. Um, and then the next step should be a little bit faster. And as you can see here, uh, we now have a root shell. But not only that, we can also go to the uh, system policy configuration directory, which is a location where the approved kernel extensions are stored in a database, which is a very sensitive location, normally protected by SIP. And as we can demonstrate here, we could write a new file into this directory. Thank you. Uh, now, about the fixes. So, uh, with the release of Monterey, that new method that I showed at the start was added, and applications can now indicate that they only accept secure serialized objects. So, Apple enabled this for all of their own applications, so the, the exploits previously were no longer possible. But third-party applications may use that uh, ability to store their own objects in that saved state. So therefore, that method is needed to, uh, for applications so they can opt out if they don't support that yet. I'm not completely clear if it's still exploitable uh, if the applications don't store any objects. Uh, I still need to look into that a bit more. Uh, this was reported to Apple on December 4th, 2020. And then they fixed the sandbox uh, escape earlier than the rest in 11.3 uh, in April. Um, and then they fixed it completely uh, with the release of macOS Monterey, which is in October 2021. Now, originally I thought they did not backport this fix to the, or the two older macOS versions. Generally, Mac Apple keeps supporting three versions, so the, the previous one and the one before. 
But in the release notes, it was only mentioned for macOS Monterey when it was released. So I thought they didn't backport it. But then I was wor working on these slides, and uh, two weeks ago or something like that, I noticed that Apple had updated the rele release notes of the Catalina security update. Uh, that was at the same time as Monterey. They updated this back in May, so half a year later. Um, and there they also now list this vulnerability as being fixed. And a week before I give, gave this uh, for now, uh, Apple Product Security emailed me spontaneously with um, ARC, hey, you're going to do a talk at DEF CON. Would you be willing to tell us what you're going to talk about? Maybe we can provide some feedback. So I just asked them, well, um, is it fixed in Catalina and Big Sur? Because it was not in the, in the release notes for Big Sur, which is weird because it was in Catalina, which is the older version. Um, and then yesterday at about 8 a.m., they got back to me and told me, yeah, it's supposed to be fixed uh, in all of these. Uh, if you can still reproduce it, then please let us know. But that really wasn't enough time for me to look into it a bit more if it is actually fixed. So there's, um, yeah. I still need to look a bit more into whether it was actually fixed in those older versions. So to conclude, macOS has security boundary between processes, not, not only between users, and process injection vulnerabilities are now very important uh, because they can break those boundaries between processes and allow dangerous entitlements to be used by other processes. The CVE 2021-30 87.3 was a process injection vulnerability affecting all AppKit-based app applications, therefore allowing all powerful entitlements to be abused by malware. We demonstrated how it could be applied to escape the sandbox, elevate privileges to root, and to bypass the file system restrictions of SIP, and was fixed in October last year. Some takeaways here. macOS security keeps adding more and more defensive layers. But adding new layers to an established system is quite difficult. Code written 10, 10 years ago or more, more than that can suddenly become attack servers that nobody has thought about when it was being written. And also, I think an interesting point here is that the effort of attackers may not really increase if you add more layers, if you can just use the same bug for bypassing multiple layers uh, in the same way. So to make sure that security layers work, you really need to make sure that they actually uh, yeah, are different enough that you cannot use the same technique. I have some references here about work that I used, uh, the write-up from Alias, for example, and some other uh, resources about serialized objects. And we will publish a full write-up with a lot more of the te technical details that I had to skip. Um, I will do this over the next couple of days uh, at most. If you want to know more, uh, follow me on Twitter or our research department. Um, and I'll take any questions if you have them. Okay, so the question is, is there remaining risk for enterprises and uh, users? Well, I don't really know um, if older versions of macOS are vulnerable, as I said at the end. So updating to the latest version would be a good recommendation and uh, keeping updated. Yeah, if you're developing an application yourself, then uh, being aware of this type of vulnerability would also be important. But otherwise, users cannot really do that much about this. Uh, there's not really any tools that can protect against something this, uh, yeah, against this type of attack. Uh, 